Good morning. Uh, my name is Justin O'Brien of Dwyer and Kalora. For the plaintiffs, uh, with me is Michael Kalora. May it please the court. The plaintiffs in this case are a class of uh, former employees in Massachusetts of defendant Citigroup uh, and related companies who forfeited earned compensation to the companies uh, under the company's capital accumulation plan, or CAP. Was it, were they getting dividends on the stock while, while it was held in this CAP plan? Uh, they were getting dividends on the restricted stock uh, during the vesting period. Th this plan was voluntary, wasn't it, at least for the uh, ordinary employees? Uh, I'd say two things, Your Honor. First, uh, there was a component uh, of the plan that was voluntary in the sense that uh, the employees enrolling in the plan signed a form. <coughs> uh, there's evidence in the record that uh, there was uh, significant pressure on employees, on those employees to participate, first of all. Uh, and secondly, um, the information uh, provided to the employees regarding the ultimate effect of the plan uh, we submit was uh, entirely inadequate in that there was only really one line uh, or I should say part of one line in all of the information that they received that indicated uh, that the forfeiture provision would apply. But what's that got to do? I mean, this is a deferred compensation plan that, that employees have signed <coughs> up for. Haven't we ruled that deferred compensation plans are not uh, covered by the wage statute? Uh, Your Honor, I'd submit that uh, the plan here was drastically different uh, from the plan that was at <coughs> issue in the Boston Police case. Uh, this really was not your typical uh, 401k type uh, retirement plan where compensation is deferred for uh, years and years and years and, and uh, vests on retirement. How long, that, that's one thing I never understood, maybe I'm missing it, how long was it before the stock would vest? Uh, depending on the particular plan that was at issue, it was either two or three years. Two For the payroll deduction, is it payroll deduction folks, the sort of voluntary folks, regular folks, that would be two years? Uh, that would be two years, Your Honor. So if you left in that two-year period, you, you forfeited not only the potential stock you were going to get, but also the money from your salary that would have bought it. That's exactly right, Your Honor. And but ditto for the three-year thing. I, th that's the same. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, different compensation that's at issue in the, in the so-called three-year thing. Well, with respect to the three-year thing, I mean, those, those, are, those are clearly bonuses. I mean, the, our wage statute doesn't cover bonuses of that sort, does it? Uh, well, Your Honor, we'd submit that it, it should in that uh, for, for several reasons. Uh, one, the bonuses that you're talking about are, a, a, in this case, are not uh, some sort of illusory uh, bonus that's going to be available at the end of three years if you're still at the company. Uh, this is a bonus that was awarded uh, year by year uh, in the sense of you got to the end of the year as, as an employee and the company said, congratulations, you got X as a bonus. And your bonus will be in part paid in cash and in part paid in this deferred compensation plan in which you can earn significant benefits, but if you leave, you're going to forfeit that part of your bonus. What's wrong with that? Why is that a violation of the wage law? Because, Your Honor, we believe that uh, the, the public policy that's at issue is the same uh, as it would be for commissions in that, uh, or, or other types of compensation in that once the uh, once the bonus is awarded, um, the, the employee is staying there under the impression that um, they have some entitlement to that bonus. The other thing I'd point out how could, is... How could they have entitlement if the bonus is contingent on them staying for a certain period of time? How can they say, well, we're entitled to it today even though we actually don't get it unless we stay three years? How, how when I say entitled, Your Honor, what I mean is that, that uh, <coughs> the employee is going, when, once the, the bonus is held out in the sense of if you're still here in three years, you get the bonus, the employee's already done whatever <laughs> they have to do to get the amount of the bonus determined. Well, no, they, they've, they've earned the right to get a deferred compensation component. That's part of their bonus. That's what they've earned, right? They haven't earned the right to get that money today because that's not the bonus plan. Yes, Your Honor, but uh, if, if, if the bonus, if, if, excuse me, if the capital accumulation plan, uh, if the forfeiture violates the wage statute, uh, then... But Mr. Mr. O'Brien, it's sort of a cart before the horse. Presumably an employer can say, I have X amount of cash and I'm going to pay workers for this, 
I'm also going to reward people who I would like to make sure stay with the company. But I'm only going to reward them if they stay with the company. In other words, past behavior is predictive of future behavior. You haven't done the future behavior, but I'm going to I'm going to make a guesstimate that if you stay, you will do well. And so I'm going to give you. It's it's really not a um, it's not a bonus in that sense. It's simply saying I'm going to reward you if you stay because based on your behavior this past year, I've determined that it will be very valuable if you stay. Uh, Your Honor, I'd say two things. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to distinguish when we talk about bonuses that there are really two different uh, programs at issue. The bonus program and the branch manager. Exactly. Yeah. And the branch manager program uh, was uh, th the bonus was determined according to a formula which was really based on <coughs> performance for the year and there's uh, testimony in the record that employees the branch managers could look at the formula look at the uh, performance of the branch and, and monitor how they were doing such that when they got to the end of the year they'd say um, you know I'm going to get this amount in a bonus so it was calculated so in other words is, is it like a commission I didn't get that sense it, it's uh, calculated but isn't that in a law I mean this may be but in a law firm you may say you know <coughs> people you know associates who bill 28 billable hours 2800 2800 <laughs> thank you I'm, I'm, I'm so familiar with it I just assumed uh, 2800 billable hours two things a, we're going to have a part of it. There's going to be a formula so that you know and, that, and your colleague knows that if you if you bill 2800, what it'll be. So you can decide whether you want to, you know, lead a miserable life and put in 2800 billable hours. Uh, but part of that is going to be compensation for, you know, that year. But part of it is because the law firm is saying these are the kinds of people we want to remain. But we're not going to pay them cash. We're not agreeing to pay them cash unless they remain. What's wrong with that? And why is that a violation of the wage statute? Uh, because, again, Your Honor, I, th I think it's uh, that the bonus, if you will, vests to some extent in the employee at the end of the year. The, the company is taking uh, deductions prospectively throughout the year based on what it anticipates fr from all of the employee's compensation, from the total compensation. Well, that's the first plan. Uh, it's the second plan as well, Your Honor. It's, it's both the bonus program and the branch manager program that they're taking uh, based on a total percentage of, of or a percentage of the total compensation throughout the year based on uh, what, what, the, um, what the bonus is anticipated to be. Expl explain that. I, I read that in your brief, and trust me, I was confused. <laughs> well, y Your Honor, the way I understand it is that, that – uh, I'm a branch man, or I'm, I'm covered by the bonus part of this program, so yeah. give me some hypotheticals about me. Basically, uh, if you have, if you, uh, your total compensation amounts to X, uh, then you fall in a particular category, and during the course of the year, uh, it's sort of anticipated that you're going to have a certain percentage, uh, excuse me, a, a bonus of a certain amount. Over X, that'll be X plus? X plus bonus. Well, X plus bonus is the total compensation package for the year. The so I have the yeah bonus. compensation compensation X. It's anticipated that I will get bonus Y. So X plus Y is my total compensation estimate. Right, uh, and there's a there's a deduction made based on that estimation at the end of the year uh, when the bonus is uh, you mean actually t tax calculated. Tax withholding is that what you mean? I'm sorry. What what's the deduction? Uh, it's the deduction for the purposes of uh, the CAP plan. That's, that's, that's the uh, As the year is going on? Yes. Yes. From that's all employees. I'm sorry? From all employees. From all employees in the plan. In yes, the bonus correct. plan. I, I'm sorry, but I don't understand something very basic. I mean, it's, it's my failing. But if you win, and this um, bonus or whatever is subject to the Wage Act, and the employers don't like that, then they'll just take away the bonuses. So how do you, in the overall scheme of things, win? I, your, your Honor, in, your in clients win the future. But I mean, <laughs> other people won't win. And, and, and assuming your clients go on to work for this or similar type companies, and I assume this type of practice is quite prevalent in the industry, how do people in your client's position win overall? Well, it's a win in the sense of. It's uh, a win a for a these few people who are here. Well, Your Honor, it's also a win in, in the sense of truth in advertising, in that, uh, you know, here's what your compensation is going to be for the, for the year at this company. 
including this anticipated bonus. Yeah, but these bonuses bonus. are tremendous. I mean, it, and so if they get taken away, um, what? Well, well, Your Honor, I, just, I, sh I should point out that the, the cap plan was available uh, to at least certain employees who had much smaller bonuses. It wasn't simply sort of the highest paid executives at the company. Well, um, the highest paid executives had, had to participate because this was part of their bonus plan, mm -hmm. but the lower paid employees could participate voluntarily, you say it's, well, maybe didn't have full information, by having um, money deducted for purposes of the, defer of the plan. That's right, Your Honor. But for the three-year plan, <coughs> what, what's wrong with a company trying to entice uh, its employees to stay? There's a benefit to the company. There's nothing per se wrong with that. It's, it's how the company chooses to go about it. Uh, it's, it's one thing to say if you're here at the end of three years, um, we're going to give you a bonus of X. It's another thing to say, and I, and I recognize this is, a, this is a, a somewhat of a fine line, but to say that uh, you get to the end of the year, here's your bonus, here's some of it in cash, but actually we're going to withhold uh, part of it, and if you're not in here in two or three, uh, I should say three years, you're not going to get any of the bonus. So What's it's just how it, gets it, it's, I mean, it's how it gets worded, I take it. I mean, maybe this is what the Chief Justice was asking, but they could. You would not disagree that they could say, here's your bonus, which is, but let's say the total amount of the bonus is 100. And so they say at the end of the year, here's your bonus for this year, it's 75, and if you're here um, two years from now, you're going to get another 25. That wouldn't be a problem, would it? No. I don't believe it would. But it, isn't it that so in effect what they've done? Again, it's, it's not what they've done, particularly with the branch manager program where there's uh, a performance driven formula uh, by which the bonus is calculated so that they get to the end of the year and they think, well, this is my bonus. And then the company, as they do with uh, the commission uh, plan people, uh, they say, you know, we're not actually going to give you the whole bonus. Oh, but that's not a surprise. I mean, it's not like at the end of the year, oh, guess what? You're not really going to get cash bonus. I mean, this is part of the plan. This is what they buy into. This is part of their, isn't it? The company doesn't decide at the end of the year, oh, guess what? We're not going to give you the, your estimated bonus in cash. We're going to do a little bit this and a little bit that. Uh, no, it's, it's this, the that, policy, that aspect of the, the of the That's the compensation policy of the company, right? Right. we were to agree with you, would that mean that the bonus had to be paid within six days of each of the weeks or, or uh, in other words, you, I mean essentially as I uh, read section 148, if you've got wages due, you have to pay them. If they've been earned, you can do it weekly or bi-weekly or on some other basis. Does that mean that the bonus has to be paid out as you're going along? I don't believe it does, Your Honor. Uh, I believe. Uh, and how do you get around that? Because uh, I, uh, there's a case the name's escaping me yeah. at the moment, but uh, there has been case law that, um, despite the sort of title and basic provisions of the weekly weekly wage law, so-called, um, there's no requirement that uh, <coughs> that wages actually be paid on a weekly basis. Um, and I think, particularly where the court has has read into the purpose of, of this statute uh, a prohibition on unreasonable detention. Uh, there's a difference between sort of reasonable detention of wages for purposes uh, of, of a bonus plan where you're going to be getting the bonus at some point and an unreasonable detention which is the complete forfeiture uh, of either that so bonus or commission or any, any other form of compensation. So what you're saying is if these employees had stayed for the two or three years, you wouldn't be arguing that they needed to be paid before the two or three year point when under the cap plan they would be paid. Y your argument is if they leave within that vesting period, that's where you, w where you are saying that, that's that, the problem. That's correct, Your Honor. Our, our, our argument is entirely tied to, the, to that clause of the statute that says all the provisions about uh, timeliness of of weekly wage payment or payment on a certain basis, but when the employee leaves, the employee shall be paid in full. Uh, it, it's granted it's in a sentence uh, or in a portion of the statute that's referring to wages, but that clause just says paid in full uh, on termination. Now how, how do you deal, I, I saw how you dealt with it in, in your brief, but the Citigroup takes the, the position that, look, the whole tax basis of this plan requires 
in fact, that there be a substantial loss of risk or a substantial risk of loss <laughs> or a substantial risk of forfeiture. I can't remember what the words are. And forfeiture. Yeah. Forfeiture. forfeiture. And that's, that's exactly what this plan provides. If it didn't provide that, it wouldn't be tax exempt or it wouldn't pro you know, conform to the tax laws. Couldn't be done. Uh, Your Honor, I'd suggest, as, as we do in the briefs, that uh, there's really no basis for that argument. It's true that that is one way to achieve the tax deferral uh, that the CAP plan achieves. But under Section 83, which provides for uh, substantial risk of forfeiture, it, it, the, the, the statute says as well that uh, if you're simply making an uh, unfunded, unsecured promise to, to uh, transfer a benefit at some point in the future, uh, then there is no need for uh, substantial risk of forfeiture. A and I should point out that the, the, the plan here uh, provided for deferred stock, so-called, as opposed to restricted stock, which uh, the company could have issued its discretion and which would have met that uh, criteria such that there would... Well, if, you're saying the company could have set up another different kind of plan. Uh, it, it could have exercised tax it, it, it could have exercised the discretion that it had under the plan as set up to issue deferred stock instead of restricted stock, and there wouldn't even be the suggestion. Uh, at but that of course, restricted stock is a benefit because I, I take it during this period of restriction, your clients got dividends and voting rights. Uh, they did under under the deferred stock. They would get uh, dividend equivalents, not dividends. Specifically, but uh, there thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, <coughs> Ms. Bansell. Th thank you, Madam Chief Justice. Uh, with your, with the court's permission, we have an application for my admission pro hoc vice, which we will allow. Thank you. Uh, the question certified to this court by the Federal District Court of Massachusetts is whether the Citigroup Cap Plan, the Capital Accumulation Plan, violates the weekly wage law. Uh, most certainly it does not. But before I get into the legal argument, I think it's important to go through the, the separate plans and the specific provisions of them that constitute the CAP plan. There are three programs within the CAP plan. Right. Uh, the first is what we have referred in our brief as the financial consultant plan, which is an elective program, and it covers the vast majority of Citigroup's financial professionals. They're allowed at their election to choose to receive some portion of their stock uh, in a portion that they designate in the form of restricted stock. Portion of their compensation? Yes, some, a portion of their compensation in the form of restricted stock. So they agree that some portion of that compensation will be earned and become vested two years down the road. And we submit that that does not constitute clearly under this court's precedence uh, wages under the weekly wage law. So that's one program. That's the financial consultant pro program, and it's an elective program. Uh, the forms that are signed are quite clear in terms of the elections that employees make that choose to participate in this program. There's an election form that says that a percentage will of, of compensation will be received, quote, in the form of restricted stock, and that if the employee leaves the company voluntarily or for cause before the restricted stock vests, which in this particular program is a two-year vesting period, then, quote, I will forfeit the restricted stock as well as the compensation I have authorized to be paid in the form of such restricted stock. So End you're quote. saying it's basically this is the kind of situation where you have a uh, something that is contingent on an event occurring, and if you don't wait until the event occurs, it's not wages for purposes of the wage statute. That's correct. As, as this court said in the Boston police case, not all compensation is wages. And here, the employee elects to receive some of his or her compensation in the form of unvested stock, which we submit is not wages under, is the, under um, is the Assuming that I, as an employee, um, elect to participate in the financial consultant program, and let's assume my weekly wage is $100, and I elect to participate, do I get $20 of, w of payment a week and then $20 of uh, deferred stock, of stock? You mean 80 and 20? I mean, yes, 80 and 20. I, I, I think the way to view it is that you get, yes, you get $80. It's a little complicated because the formula, part of the benefit that Citigroup offers its employees is they're able to purchase the stock at a discount. So the twenty dollars of stock would actually be one third more of that. So you know. So in fact, you're getting a 
quote, additional compensation in addition to the benefits of deferral. That's correct. And in addition, of that, of that $20 compensation which you elect to receive in the form of restricted stock, you also get to defer the taxes on that. Right. So you no, I understand that. It's an right. enormous benefit. Right. So you get the tax deferral plus you get the discount. Do you get an internal buildup as well? Yes. In other words, if the stock price increases, no, forget it. It's okay. It's, yeah. not I mean it's not really accurate to call it deferred compensation, is it, in the sense of the Boston police case? <laughs> Because the Boston police case had no forfeiture at issue. Well, two responses to that, uh, Your Honor. First of all, I think it, it's, uh, it's unvested compensation. It's contingent compensation in the same way that the deferred compensation plan was in Boston police. So when an employee receives compensation in the form of restricted stock, that restricted stock, because it's subject to future performance uh, future continued employment at the company for two years, it's subject to a condi condition in the future. That is not considered wages under Boston police. With respect to the... Well, I'm not so sure about that because under Boston police they're talking about a, a traditional deferred compensation plan, are they not? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think and, and right. in a deferred compensation plan you get your money back if you leave employment. You might not get as much if you've invested it um, unwisely in you know various kinds of funds, but you get it back. Here you don't. Th so that seems to me to totally eliminate the Boston police case from any persuasive value for your position in this case. Well, the issue, with all due respect, Your Honor, in Boston police was not about forfeiture or whether or not that's permissible. It's whether or not the form of compensation constitute wa constitutes wages under the weekly wage law. And and, and just to pick up where where the where the bench was asking uh, my colleague at the end of. Uh, his, his argument. In this particular case, it's, it's notable that the plaintiffs are not saying that the deferred compensation or the restricted stock is something they should have the right to receive within a week or a month or, you know, wages that un the weekly wage law says should be paid regularly. The purpose of the weekly wage law is to prevent uh, the accumulation or the withholding of wages over an undue period of time. They're not saying that holding this for two years is disallowed. So th their concern is not really with the issue that's at the heart of the weekly wage law. And the issue in Boston police had to do with the fact that the particular uh, deferred compensation was not being purchased. The, it was, well, wasn't being sent to the deferred, uh, d deferred compensation uh, investor, so to speak, within a sufficient amount of time. So at issue in that case was, <coughs> the, was the heart of what the weekly <coughs> wage law is about, which is making sure that you get paid on time. That you get paid on time. That's right. So the issue in Boston Police was not about forfeiture, and I think forfeiture is a little bit of a red herring here. Um, and in fact, there's numerous cases in this court uh, under the weekly wage law, as as well as under common law, which says that forfeiture is not is not not is not impermissible under the weekly wage law. For example, a number of the cases uh, that we cited, including Sharf. Buell, Sterling Research, and Hoops, all of these involved situations under the Wage Act where an employee uh, was, was contractually entitled to certain payments, compensation, bonuses, different forms of payment, of different forms of compensation, but the condition for he or she receiving that compensation was that they continue in the employee of the company. When they didn't continue in the employee of the company, they forfeited that compensation. And the courts in, in those respective cases found that there was not a violation of the Weekly Wage Act because the condition precedent to the vesting of that compensation had not yet occurred. So we submit that's precisely what's, what the situation we have here. And also on point is this, this court's case, Harrison, from 2001. Now that was not a case under the Weekly Wage Law, but it's remarkably uh, on point because in that particular case, the employee said, that he gave up getting a certain amount of salary uh, that he would have otherwise earned because he agreed to receive part of his compensation in the form of company stock that would vest on a specified schedule in the future. Now, in that particular case, he, he left, his, his employment was terminated, and a, num a bunch of that stock hadn't, in fact, vested. And he argued that that stock was earned by him because it represented the work he had done in the past. Um, and it represented payment for past services. Now this court said that that was not, in fact, earned compensation 
um, because even though he would have otherwise taken a higher salary instead of taking those unvested shares, the terms of the agreement that he had meant that those shares would not vest until some point in the future. So under those, even though that represented compensation for, for services he had already rendered, the court held that that was not, that, th that those were not wages. Ms. Spence, may I ask you this, and you may have answered it in your brief, and I just can't recall. You, you cite us to a number of cases, and mo they're mostly intermediate appellate cases, I think, around the country, <laughs> where these kinds of uh, deferred comp plans have been, uh, where the court has determined that they, that they do satisfy the applicable state wage statute. Right. Are, they, are, are those... Are you are talking about the CAP? The yes. specific CAP plans? Yeah. yeah. Uh, CAP. Uh, are they cases that go the other way? There are not. There are not. There were, in Illinois and New Jersey, the intermediate appellate right. courts I know, I know about that had too. gone the other way, but then they were reversed. Right. So, uh, no, T to date, there has not been a single court that has invalidated CAP under any state law or even under common law. So you've talked about the financial consultant right. program. What about the Right. Bonus? So the financial consultant program is the, is the elective program. <coughs> the second program is the bonus program. Right. Now, the bonus program is 100 percent entirely discretionary as to whether or not a particular employee even receives a bonus in a given year. Now, um, Chief Justice Marshall asked the question, made the analogy with respect to the law firm. An associate bills 2,800 hours. Um, isn't, isn't he or she, you know, th there, there may be some basis on which that, that bonus is uh, allocated or, or distributed. But in this particular case, I think the more, the, the more apt analogy is that the 2,800-hour guideline would be a guideline, but not a guarantee of a bonus. In this particular case, Citigroup says... Yes, no, I was talking about the... Mine was to the branch manager case, not the bonus qua bonus. Okay, well, okay, I'll turn to that. So, bo so bonus is entirely discretionary. It's entirely discretionary. So if Citigroup, you know, has a bad year, if it has a particularly good year, the range of it could go from anywhere from zero to a, a, a very vast sum. It's the case, sum. as uh, was argued, that at the end of the year, if you're the, the person with the bonus, you are told your bonus is going to be X amount. Is that so? Uh, but there's no guarantee of that at the, at, at the beginning of the year. No, I know. But yeah. when you get to the end of the year, right? Um, and the, the company says you have a thousand dollar bonus, and I take it under this plan, you'll get some portion of it in cash. Yes, That's right. And some portion of it in deferred. That's right. Stock. Restricted so stock. if you leave. That's December 31, and you leave on January 10th of the mm -hmm. following year. All you're going to get is that portion of the cash. You've lost the the deferred. Right? That's right. So at the end of that year, it isn't it isn't discre I mean, in the sense that it's a defined amount of money, but but you're just saying it's sort of like the financial consultant. There has been an agreement. Well, I don't know. Is it like the financial consultant that, well, that part of it is going to that part of the plan is this bonus, this is Justice Cordy's point before, that part of the plan is that the bonus is made up of two components, one you get now, one you get later, and that's just the way it is? Right. It might be a defined amount of money, but it's not due and payable, yeah. which, is, which is the point under the weekly wage law. It's not, it, because it becomes payable two years down the road or three years down the road in case of the, of the bonus program. So that's why it, the bonus program is not. Well, is it even a defined amount of money because it's, it's a number, or is it a number of shares of stock because two or three years later the stock will be worth different? That's right. It, so it's it, not yeah. even a defined yeah. amount of money. I guess I'm saying even if it were a defined amount of money, it's certainly not due and payable because it's due to this future contingent vesting. Um, the third program, so, so, so the bonus program is entirely discretionary. Under this court's clear case law, bonuses that are entirely discretionary are, just do not constitute wages. And uh, the plaintiffs have not cited a single case in which they can say that the discretionary bonuses are wages. The third program is the branch manager program. And this, this affects just a very, very small number of Citigroup employees. Uh, the branch manager program is, in fact, a hybrid of the payroll program, uh, the, the financial consultant program, rather, and the bonus program. And what it says, essentially, is that uh, branch managers, they, they will get a portion of their comp They'll get a certain amount of compensation uh, that's, that, that may or may, that they're probably wages. And then on top of that, they get a bonus. And the bonus, some portion of that will, it's, it's like the bonus program. It will either come in the form of deferred or restricted stock, 
or for some of the branch managers, they have the opportunity to elect to participate in the financial consultants program. So, so the branch manager program is really a hybrid of the two other programs. There's, it, it's not really unique. The only difference <coughs> is that the bonus portion of the branch manager program does have certain guidelines that give some guidance as to how the bonus might be calculated. Unlike the bonus program, which is entirely discretionary and has no guidelines, the branch manager program does have some guidelines. Written. But, Wr written guidelines. Yes, it does have some written guidelines. But again, it, it, the, the same written guidelines continue to say that it's entirely discretionary. It depends on the, any particular year. So even though they're kind of general guides, there's no, there's no proportion, there's no allocation, there's no guarantee. Um, so it's, it's, like, it's like saying associates that bill 2,800 hours might get a bonus if the law firm happens to have a very good year. But are, are there withholding? Is there a certain withholding as the year is going on towards that? Or is that just the fin I, I may be confusing yeah. them. Mechanically, how does it work during the year? Yes. Well, actually, that th those facts are not part of the joint statement of facts, the specific workings of the branch manager program. So well, there was some description about the stock is buy bought every six months, or yeah, that, that's actually not in the joint statement of facts. It's just in the briefs. <laughs> it's in it's in one side's briefs, but w we've resisted characterizing that because it's not fully part of the record. Okay. So, uh, if I could, you have the other the other point I would just make. Quickly, yeah. Okay, just one more point, which is that even assuming, first of all, we think the case law is clear, as I, as I pointed out, that wages, that, that the restricted stock are not wages, uh, whether they're in the financial consultant program or the bonus program. But even if they work to constitute wages, there's a whole nother provision of, of the, the, the Massachusetts yeah. general laws, which says that uh, there's an exception from the Weekly Wage Act for deductions that are made for employee stock plans. So this is uh, Chapter 154, Section 8. And we, we actually think the proper way to conceive of this is not really so much as a deduction for an employee stock plan. We think the better way to conceive of this program is that some form of the compensation is received in the form of restricted stock. So it's not that they receive their wages and then they, they deduct it. It's that part of their their compensation is received in the form of restricted stock. So we think the first view is really the right way of viewing the program. But if the court were to view this as wages, even the restricted stock, then we would submit that the exception to the weekly wage law is for deductions made pursuant to employee stock purchase plans. So either way, uh, the particular program here is, does not run afoul of the weekly wage law. Thank you, Thank you. Ms. Bansell.